Hello and welcome to Rites Chapel. My name is Tanya and I'm the Director of Connection Ministries. Thank you for worshiping with us today. If you haven't already, we'd like to ask you to type in your name and the name of those worshiping with you in the comment section. If you're worshiping with us today via YouTube, we're hoping that you will subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're worshiping with us today via Facebook, we're hoping that you will like and share today's service with others. As always, if you have questions about Rites Chapel or you'd like to learn more about its ministries, feel free to reach out to me directly at tanya at rightschapel.org. Again, thanks so much for worshiping with us today, and may God bless you as Clay leads us into a song of praise. Hi, I'm Clay Motley, the music director here at Rites Chapel, and I'm inviting you to join us as we sing these songs here, wherever you find yourself. Join us, sing along, sing out loud, do the claps, dance, whatever you need to do to, to stay as if you are here in person with us. We'd love for you to join us for this. Come on. Chapel. It is so good to be in worship with you this day. Whenever it is you are worshiping with us, we, we pray that you will feel God drawing near to you as, as you seek to draw near to God. My name is Charles. I'm pastor here at Rice Chapel. Again, we thank you for 
uh, for joining us for worship. If you haven't already, we want to invite you to welcome, we want to invite you to check in. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. You can do that by simply by simply typing your name and the names of any of those in the room with you in the comment section, or uh, or if you're on YouTube, um, go ahead and text Tanya on your phone at 540-604-0038. 540-604-0038. So helpful for us to know who it is that's worshiping with us. We also want to uh, just invite you, if you're ever in the area, um, uh, if you're worshiping with us from out of town or, or if you're passing through, to stop into the church. If, you're, if you live in the community, stop in during the week sometime or, or join us on a Sunday morning. We'd love to make that face-to-face -face connection with you um, as well. I want to uh, give a shout out to, to Joshua Kopetz. And, and uh, he's been worshiping with us for the last several weeks online. So great to have Joshua uh, worshiping with us. Just a couple of announcements of, of things that uh, will be happening this week if you're, if you're in the area. Um, we'll be having a, a pancake supper on uh, Tuesday evening from 5.30 to 6.30 in our fellowship hall. Uh, Fat Tuesday, we'll be taking a love offering that will help uh, pay for our potato drop, our mission dro uh, potato drop that's going to be happening in April. But 5.30, 6.30, Fat Tuesday pancake supper. Um, going to be a great time. Hope that you'll join us. Then on Ash Wednesday, we begin the season of Lent, this 40-day season of preparation as we get ready for Easter. Um, we'll have ashes uh, distribution on uh, at noon and also at 7 uh, p.m. Uh, here in the, in the sanctuary. I'll also be doing a, a service online uh, for Ash Wednesday as well. And uh, after in-person service at 12 o'clock, we'll be having our, starting our Lenten lunch program where we have a potluck lunch uh, if you're in the area, we'd love to have you join us. Or if you work in the area, stop by and have lunch with us uh, and that as well. We'll also be, um, also be reading through the Gospel of Matthew for this season of Lent. We've put together a 40-day uh, reading plan, and uh, Tanya will be posting that reading plan for you. And, uh, and you can just use your Bible. If you need a Bible, let us know, and we will get one, we will get one to you. But we're looking forward to... Uh, to reading through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, I'll be leading a Bible study on Wednesday nights on the Gospel of Matthew, and I'll be preaching um, uh, through the season on the Gospel of Matthew. And so I hope that you'll plan to join us for that, for that series. As we move into a time of prayer, I want to invite, if you have any prayer requests, to share them in the comment section. We have a team of folks that want to be in prayer and ministry with you. And so let us prepare then to go to God in prayer. Hi, I'm Owen, and let's pray. Gracious God, we thank, you, we thank you for the example of your Son who modeled love for others and, and the wisdom that comes from walking with you. From Jesus we learn all that is good, merciful and compassionate, just as people who are drawn to Jesus. We come in this moment of prayer in order to draw near to you. Renew us by your Spirit, do your holy work in us, healing us, correcting us, comforting us, and encouraging us, so that we may live more like Jesus in our world. Here in our prayers this day, for those who are sick, lonely, confused, and exhausted from the stress, stresses of life, may you rest and your peace fall upon them and renew them and fill them with strength and hope. We pray with confidence the prayers Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, by thee our name, the kingdom come, the whole be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our dairy bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen.
Hi, my name is Grady, and I'm reading Matthew 17, 1 through 8. Six days later, Jesus took him with Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly there appeared to, it, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes... They saw no one except Jesus himself alone. I want to thank all those who have helped lead us in our worship uh, this, this day. Let us then, uh, let us pray together. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts truly be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Have uh, anyone, any of y'all ever faced a turning point? A turning point in your life. I, I, I suspect most of us have. Um, you, you may have not given it a whole lot of thought, but there was a, a moment in time, there was an experience, there was a decision made, there was something that you did, uh, something that was done for you or maybe to you, when from that moment on, your life was different. From that moment on, you saw the world through a different lens. And your actions and your attitudes and your thoughts and and your life changed. Curious if, if, you're, if you're comfortable, go ahead and share. What was, a, what was a turning point? What was one of the turning points that you've experienced in, in your life? Go ahead and make that comment in the section if you're comfortable uh, doing so. Let us know. I just tell you, long ago, um, there was a turning point in, in my relationship with my, with my now wife, Amy. <laughs> and the relationship turned. Uh, when Amy went from seeing me simply as this, as this gorgeous hunk of a man who's fun to go on a date with, and it, and it turned, and she began to see me as this person that she wanted to spend the rest of her life with. and It was a turning point. And from then on, each of us we began to see each other in a different way and through a different lens. Sometimes those turning points are, are brought on by more negative circumstances that can that can sometimes lead to positive change. Maybe it's an illness or, or divorce, uh, for instance, can often be uh, a turning point. Uh, sometimes those turning points are brought on by more positive events, like the birth of a child or, or the making of a new friend at a new job. There, there are also uh, turning points in our faith. Uh, something happens and we experience God and Jesus in a new way. I know for many of our youth, uh, mission trip experiences have been, have been turning points for them in their faith. Faith for them became real. It became hands-on for the first time. And, and they moved from riding the coattails of their parents' faith to claiming faith in Jesus as their own. This, this story of the transfiguration uh, can feel strange and and quite frankly, weird if you're, if you're hearing it for the first time. But when we get past all the mysterious happenings and clouds and voices and appearances of figures from the past, really, really what the story is, is a turning point for these three disciples. And they begin to see Jesus as he truly is. They've known Jesus as teacher as preacher, as healer, as friend. But now, up upon the mountain, they experience Jesus as son of the living God. And Peter's terrified. Left speechless. And from this moment on, with a new lens before them, they will never see Jesus in the same way ever again. And their lives will be forever changed. If you've worshipped with us the past two weeks, you, you've heard me speak about 
our God of grace. Uh, you've heard me talk all about our God of second chances. And I, I, I finished last week's sermon with the words of Jesus saying, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And we, we want our, our children here at Rice Chapel to, to grow up knowing that Jesus and, and that God loves them and cares about them. And so we, we teach them and we try to help them to experience and to, and to feel that love. And we remember how Jesus was talking to disciples near the end of his life and he said, he said to us, he said, we used, we used to think of each other differently. But now I call you my friends. And we, we sing to him, what a friend we have in Jesus. And, uh, and, and let me be very clear. Um, that is actually good theology. <laughs> it is important that we see God in Jesus as our friend and, and not simply see him as an old mean old judge handing out punishment as, as we are sometimes thought to think of Jesus as a child. But there is also a danger we face if we only focus on the friendly relationship we have with God. And the danger is that we can easily forget that God is also the power behind all that exists. You, you read throughout Scripture, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, others, when they, when they came in contact with the glory of God, they fell to their knees and they hid their faces, not because God was angry, not because God was vengeful or cruel, but they bowed low. Because they knew that their very existence was contingent upon God. And that apart from God's grace, God's power and God's glory would have completely consumed them. Peter, James, and John experienced that same sense of awe. That sense of power upon the mountain in our passage of scripture today. And again, at the sound of God's voice, they too fall to their knees in awe. The love and power of God are inseparable. And both are meant to bring us awe-filled moments. Alongside the friendship we foster with Jesus, there ought to also be a, a healthy dose of reverence, respect, fear of the Lord, it says in the scriptures. That sense of awe leads us to to walk reverently and faithfully before God. It leads us to recognize that God is God and we are not. And that reverence leads us to wanting to walk in God's way rather than walking our own roads. Too many Christians live with the misguided notion that God is simply our friend and so they mistakenly believe that God will follow us wherever we go. That's just not how it works. It is not God who follows us where we go, but we who are called to follow God. And so when we learn to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus, right alongside the hymn, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, when we learn to do that, many of us may experience a turning point in our faith. And we'll begin to see Jesus through a new lens and thus experience the true life and the joy the abundant life that God intends for us. So that's about what I have for you this morning. <laughs> that I guess we could call it a day. Or perhaps I, I could share with you some news I, I got just the other day from my cousin Teresa. And many of you know that my, my cousin Teresa lives in the, in the very small town of Andes, New York, up in the Catskill Mountains. She lives just over the mountain, just over the mountain from where I grew up. She actually lives down a Bullet Hole Road with her husband, John, and her two girls, Jenny and Jessica. Teresa, she had called just to check in, catch up. Uh, we hadn't talked in a while, but, uh, but as we talked about all the stuff coming up this week here at Rice Chapel, Ash Wednesday, and uh, Fat Tuesday, uh, uh, Teresa reminded me of how Fat Tuesday, <laughs> Fat Tuesday had been a turning point in the life of faith of Marge Thompson. I've, I've shared this story perhaps with some of you before, but I, but I, think, it's a, I think it's a story worth sharing again. Uh, the, the bullet hole is, is still covered in snow, and, and, uh, and, and like the black bears that live in the woods around them, Teresa said most folks around there, they've been all hibernating for the winter too. Porcupines have actually been more the issue, said Teresa. John, uh, 
John actually got his gun out uh, the other night to, to, to shoot one. It was, it was out there by the log pile when he had gone out there to get wood for the wood stove. Seems to have been gnawing on the, on the maple uh, tree bark. Uh, normally they go after, after hickory, uh, Teresa said, but, uh, but they seem to have gotten a taste for the maple trees this year. Uh, John went back out, but uh, he never did see it again, Teresa said. Porcupines, they're, they're, they're really, they're so quiet. Uh, Teresa was, was telling how, how Randy Whitaker's dog, Butch, uh, got into a, a mess with a porcupine down at the Andes Presbyterian Church a while ago. Randy was, was down there setting up the stage in the fellowship hall for the pancake supper and the Fat Tuesday talent show. And, and of course, Randy, he had, had his dog with him, always has his dog with him. And, and the next thing he knows, he hears his dog yelping, and, and that dog has a face full of quills. Uh, Randy is Randy's pretty sure the, uh, the porcupine had been living under the shed um, out back of the church for some time. And, and of course, after Fat Tuesday, uh, after the Fat, Fat Tuesday fiasco the, the years earlier, uh, Randy, he was, supposed to, he was supposed to do something about it. But, but porcupines, they, they usually don't come out much during the day. And, and well, Randy's thought was that porcupine has helped teach all of us some hard lessons, uh, even Butch. I think, you know, God can even use a porcupine sometimes to, to get our attention. Maybe God thinks that's the, the way those lessons will stick. It'll stick a little better. Oh, it was a, a sticky fat Tuesday, that's for sure. You walk in, you walk in our, our fellowship hall and your, your feet still stick to the floor a bit. You, you, you have to pull them up with, with each step, said Teresa. Quite frankly, we weren't ever going to do Fat Tuesday pancakes again, but, but Pastor Paul said, no, 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 he, he still wanted us to do it. Pastor felt that even with all the mass, um, that, we're, that we're a better church. Um, without mentioning any names, he said, quite frankly, some of us are better Christians. We haven't been brought low, and if nothing else, the, the sticky floor in the fellowship hall, he said, should remind us all that with each step we take, we are to walk in the way of the Lord. It was actually the, the first year that they were ever going to do a pancake supper and, and talent show for Fat Tuesday. Um, truthfully, they got the, got the idea from us at, at Rice Chapel. I had, been, I had been talking with Teresa some time ago, and, and, and I had told her that about what we had done in, in years past um, with Fat Tuesday and talent show, and that we actually still do a pancake supper, and that we, we take donations and we raise money um, in order to support a spring, uh, a, a spring mission project. Well, Teresa thought that sounded like a, a good idea, and so she took the idea and went to Pastor Paul, and Pastor Paul, he liked it, and, and, and said, well, let's do it. And, uh, and so several years ago now, in, in January, the leadership of the Andes Presbyterian Church decided that they would do a big event for the community. They'd have a pancake supper and a talent show on Fat Tuesday right before the start of Lent. And, and they decided that they would raise some money and, and that they would use it to, to try and help send some of their own church kids as, as well as offer some of the community kids uh, a chance to go to uh, church summer camp. Well, everyone, uh, everyone thought that was a, a great idea. And Randy, he said he'd love for the church to try and help the Baxter children um, go to camp and that maybe by reaching out to them, that would help those kids find their way into the church. Uh, you know, they haven't got an easy life, Randy said. I, I think they're I think their dad is back in jail now. I heard he got another, uh, another DUI, got picked up for DUI, said Randy. And he said, I saw his wife, Joyce, uh, Randy said, and she's trying. She's trying hard, but four kids. The oldest is 10. She's just struggling. I know she's not making much working in the cafeteria at school. And she, I know she's cleaning houses on weekends. And, and someone told me that her mother has been really sick recently as well. She, just need, she needs a little love. She just needs a little love, Randy said. Marge Thompson, she, she chimed in. She, she needs more than a little love, said Marge. Listen, said Marge, I'm, I'm not sure this whole pancake and talent show is what we need to be doing in the first place. It, it doesn't seem very holy to me, but I, but I, tell, you, but I tell you right now, I, I want no part of it if we're going to throw away money on those Baxter children. They, they, are, they are just bad, criminal, just like, just like their father. 
Lucille Stetson, who's been friends with Marge for over 50 years, she spoke up and she said, Marge, you need to stop talking like that. That is, that is not Christian. We are talking about children here, said Lucille. You just don't like those children because they cut through your yard on, on their way to school. That is no reason to talk so nasty about them. They do, they do more than just cut through, said Marge. They destroyed my property. And they'll do the same thing. You start bringing those hoodlums into our church. Lucille shot back. Marge, they picked your flowers. The little girl was in first grade and she said she was sorry that she was giving them to her mother for her birthday. You need to let it go. You've been in church too long to have that attitude, said Lucille. You need to remember, Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. Well, you all do what you want, said Marge, but don't count on me if you're trying to bring the Baxter kids here. I'm not saying that God doesn't, doesn't love children, but God doesn't know these kids the way I do. I'll say, I'll say this, if God wants his church still standing, he'll change his tune when these kids start showing up. By, by the way, said Marge, I know it means nothing to y'all, but they weren't just flowers. <laughs> they were county fair prize winning tulips just to set the record straight. And Marge, she, she walked out. Well, as you might imagine, that bit of confrontation didn't set things off as well as Pastor Paul might have hoped. But, uh, but nonetheless, it, it didn't seem to quash, squash any of Randy Whitaker's enthusiasm for the event. He was all about a pancake supper and talent show. And, and more than that, he was about raising up a bunch of money that was going to help introduce a bunch of kids in his small town of Andes to Jesus and, and maybe even get them into their church. Peter and Mary Buchanan, uh, they moved up to Andy's about seven years ago from, uh, from out of New York City. Uh, Randy, Randy been after them uh, ever since they got here to come to church. They, they bought about three to 400 acres off of Cooncat Creek, and, and they started a, a new commercial business producing maple syrup. Um, Peter and Mary, had actually, they'd actually run a diner in the city for years, and they had a bunch of connections in the restaurant business down there, but but the pace and the hours were, were just so strenuous that they, that they finally, they, they got out. and They moved up to Andes and they started tapping trees on their property and, and making maple syrup. It started out as a hobby, but, but they, they grew their maple syrup business, selling mainly to restaurants in the city now. And, and now they're producing upwards of 5,000 gallons a year of some of the finest maple syrup you'll ever taste. I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever had pure maple syrup from the Catskill Mountains of New York. <laughs> I'm telling you, I grew up with it. It is something special. <laughs> it's a whole lot different than pouring Aunt Jemima on your pancakes. Well, like I said, Randy had been after Peter and Mary about coming to church. And quite frankly, Peter and Mary, they, they didn't know a lot about the Christian faith and what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. And, and so Randy, he'd been talking to them for a couple of years now, telling them how how his faith in Jesus, telling him about the church and how that has changed his life. And, and so who knows what it was, but, but Randy had gone to them and, and he asked Peter and Mary about donating some maple syrup for the pancake supper. And Randy told them what it was they were trying to do in, in their church for, for kids. And he told them about the Baxter kids and, and, and their situation. And, and it was as if something just clicked. For Peter and Mary. A turning point, perhaps. And they said they would be happy. They would be happy to donate. Well, Randy, Randy was shocked um, when he met Peter and Mary uh, down at the church on that Monday night um, before the, the Tuesday pancake supper. And in the back of their truck, they had five 100-gallon large wooden barrels of pure Catskill Mountain maple syrup. It was five cakes full of maple syrup. And Randy, Randy was shocked. I mean, they, they, were, they were expecting maybe 40, 50, maybe at, at the most 60 people at best. And Oh, oh this, is, this is way too much, said Randy. You, you, don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to do this. No, 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 said Peter and Mary. We do. 
We've actually been reading the Bible that you gave us, Randy, and it says that if you're truly going to walk with God, you're going to walk in God's way, you're, you're supposed to open up your warehouse and bring your tithes into the presence of God. Well, Mary and I, we figured we did around 5,000 gallons of syrup, and so we wanted to bring to God our tithe. 500 gallons of maple syrup. And we, we know you might not all use it tomorrow, said Peter, but you can sell it tomorrow night too if you want, and we'll help you. We've got some folks we know in the city uh, who, who, who will buy, but, but this syrup, it, it's God's syrup now. Man, he was beside himself. I mean, sitting in, sitting in front of him was 500 gallons of maple syrup worth probably close to at least probably $10,000. That, that's quite a gift, uh, said Randy. Not a gift, not a gift, said Peter, an offering. It's an offering. We're just trying to do what the Bible says. We, we decided, said Mary, that if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, then we're going, we're going all in, even with the hard stuff, said Peter. If we're going to talk the talk, we figure we better try to be ready to walk the walk. And so Randy there on that Monday night wasn't sure exactly what to do. Well, he simply helped Peter and Mary wheel in those 100-gallon barrels of maple syrup into the Andes Presbyterian Church Fellowship Hall. And they set up two tables there by the stage that Randy had built and it was all set up for the talent show. What talent you got coming in tomorrow, asked Randy. No, not, not a lot, said Randy. My girls, my girls in my fourth grade Sunday school class came up with a, with a dance they're going to do. They, they're dancing to a song called David's Dance, based on that time when David danced before the Lord to give praise to God. That sounds cute, said Mary. Buck Johnson, uh, Randy says, is going to do a rendition of How Great Thou Art on his harmonica. Uh, I didn't know Buck played the harmonica, said Peter. <laughs> Yeah, none of us did, said Randy. It, it may turn out to be more of a, a, of a joyful noise. I'm sure hoping that Marge will come over, said Randy. Her, her granddaughter wants to surprise her, and she's playing on the piano and singing the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children, All the Children of the World. Well, it sounds like it's like going to be quite a night, said, said Peter. Thank you for inviting us to be, to be a part. What else can we do to help you get ready, asked Peter and Mary. And he said, well, I'm blowing, I'm blowing up some balloons if you want to help. And, and so the three of them began to blow up balloons and make balloon bouquets and attach them to the tables in that fellowship hall. Marge Thompson, who, who lives just in back of the church, she's seen the lights on over there in the fellowship hall Monday night. And she was curious about what was going on. She Actually, she was steaming mad as she sat in her chair peeking out the window every, every few minutes. She couldn't sleep all night thinking of how her church was being desecrated by this ungodly event for these ungodly children. And so early the next morning, while it was still dark, she got up early like she always does, and still in her slippers, in her bathrobe, she slipped there across her backyard and into the back door of the church fellowship hall. Marge didn't intend to, to stay long, so she, she left the church door open just to crack. She just had to see what Randy had been up to. She turned on one of the lights, and there she saw it, the balloons and the tables all decorated. She saw the stage up front with the spotlights that Randy had set up and the microphone he had placed there. And then she looked over there to the right, and she saw them. There on the table, kegs, five large wooden kegs. This can't be happening, she said. Not, not in my church, she thought. Oh, Marge was so mad. She was mad at Randy. She was mad at Pastor Paul. Mad at those city shysters who had brought the devil's brew into her church. To Marge, they looked like kegs of beer. And she was aghast. Pancakes and beer, she thought all so that we can send those rotten, trespassing, flower-stealing children to camp. Marge looked up on the stage, and there was the picture of Jesus, a picture that her grandmother had given many years ago to the church. It had hung in that very spot for over a hundred years. No more, said Marge. I will not allow our Lord to be a part of this travesty. She went up on the stage and she took the picture 
of Jesus from off the wall and she laid it there on the floor by the tables. Marge stood there. She tried to calm down. She stood there on that stage that Randy Whitaker had built and then she spoke into the microphone. Curse you, Randy Whitaker, she said. You're destroying my church. Marge was so mad. She was so upset. She didn't even... She didn't even notice that the church door that she had left slightly cracked open was now pushed even further open. She didn't even look up until she was startled by a balloon that suddenly popped in the back. And then Marge did look up. And she screamed. And she screamed not because of a popping balloon, but because there was a porcupine coming right down the center aisle of the fellowship hall towards her. Its long tail was brushing up against bouquets of colorful balloons. And, and that tail was, with some 30,000 pin-like quills was popping balloons everywhere. It sounded like firecrackers and fireworks on the 4th of July. And the more popping there was, the more startled that porcupine became. And the faster he seemed to be running right towards Marge, who was now stomping and jumping up and down in fear. Marge Thompson there in the house of the Lord that she had grown up in, so afraid she didn't know what to do. Lord Jesus, she cried. And so Marge, she scooted to her left, and then she scooted to her right, and then she stumbled and she knocked into one of the barrels filled with a hundred gallons of maple syrup. It was almost like dominoes in slow motion as those barrels knocked into each other and they began to roll and shake and jiggle. And then one barrel toppled off the table and it hit the floor and the top of the wooden maple barrel seemed to crack and pure, sweet, sticky, Catskill mountain syrup began to spill out onto the floor of the Andes Presbyterian Church. One after another, those barrels knocked into each other, and they fell from the tables, and the taps broke off, and the tops came unhinged, and gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons, nearly $10,000 of maple syrup was lying upon and seeping into the floor of the Andes Presbyterian Church Fellowship Hall. Marge was in such a panic. She was so afraid. Oh God, oh God, oh God, she cried out as balloons were popping and barrels were falling. And the scene was also almost too much for her to handle. She thought she was going to pass out. She could hardly breathe as she couldn't believe what was happening. In her fear, she didn't even see the porcupine make his way out the back door. Marge, literally, she jumped down off the stage. She tried to, to lift those barrels upright and to stop the syrup from pouring out. They were still, they were too heavy. There in her bathrobe and slippers, Marge got down on her hands and her knees and with her terry cloth covered arms, she was trying as best she could to gather and to sweep the syrup back into the barrels. It was no use. There was nothing she could do. She became almost motionless. In shock, perhaps. There on the floor of the Andes Presbyterian Church, Marge on her hands and knees bowed low. Who knows for how long Marge was there. She finally looked up and there in front of her, right above her, was the picture of Jesus that she had left on the stage. And Marge, she went to try and reach for the picture with her right hand. But her hand, it, it wouldn't move. Her, her, her left hand, it, it, it wouldn't move either. Mar Marge Thompson was stuck. The syrup beginning to thicken her hands, her feet, her knees stuck in about two and a half inches of the finest Catskill mountain maple syrup that God ever made. It was there as she was bowed low on the floor, almost naked before God, that Marge began to pray. And she began to pray like she had never prayed before. And Marge, she began to confess her sin as she knelt before Jesus. And she asked Jesus to forgive her and to change her and to soften her heart, but most of all to save her from this calamity that she was in. I'll tell you, the people of Andes, if they didn't believe in the power of prayer before, they do now. For God heard Marge's prayer on that fat Tuesday early morning. And God sent some children to rescue Marge. 
the four Baxter children who were on their way to school and had cut through Marge's backyard. And as they came by the church, they had seen the back door open and they had smelled the sweet smell of maple syrup. And those four children, they helped Marge get unstuck and they helped lift her back to her feet again and they then began to help her start to clean up the mess. A couple of relationships had a real turning point that day. Relationships that have since blossomed. One of those relationships had to do with Marge and the Baxter children. Marge actually helped the Baxter kids, all four of them, get to camp that summer, and they've been coming to church ever since. All four of them, part of Randy's Sunday school class. The other relationship that took a turn that early morning was a relationship between Marge and God. Marge has been different ever since, said Teresa. Every Sunday at the end of worship service, now Marge goes down to the communion rail. And even at her age, she kneels there at that rail before the cross. And she bows her head before the Lord. And when she arises from that brief moment bowed before God, she arises with a smile of peace upon her face. Teresa tells me that again this Tuesday night, Marge's granddaughter is planning to play the piano at Fat Tuesday Talent Show. And as they've done for several years now, Marge and the four Baxter children are going to sing, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. And yes, said Teresa, the picture of Jesus is hanging back up in the fellowship hall. And it will be there Tuesday night, right alongside another five kegs of the finest maple syrup that God ever made. Maybe, just maybe, being brought low, bowing before our God, truly coming under, to understand the fear of the Lord, maybe that really is a turning point that leads to life, to true life, to a joy-filled life, said Teresa. Hopefully, <laughs> We all won't have to learn that in the same way Marge did. Well, I got to tell you, that's the news from my cousin Teresa and from down Bullet Hole Road. I do hope you'll join us here this week at Rice Chapel for services on Ash Wednesday. But please also plan to come out to our Fat Tuesday Pancake Supper. And I promise that next week I'm going to preach a real sermon. Peace. And amen. And again, let me just say thank you for the gifts you give to the life of our church that just allow us to do so much ministry in the name of Christ. And uh, uh, for years now, we have been working uh, with our partner church down at St. Mary's Catholic Church, um, St. Mary's of the Annunciation. And, and we work doing, uh, doing ministry, mission together uh, with Micah. And um, this last, uh, this last week, uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was, uh, we served 100 meals with Micah um, between the two of our churches. And we go together and do that um, and, and purchase them and turn those over to, to Micah to give to those, um, to those who are in need in the Fredericksburg community. And, uh, and I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for that work that continues to happen. I'm thankful you for that ministry, for that partnership that we continue to, to make with, with our brothers and sisters at uh, St. Mary's. And, and I know that they are thankful as well. And we look forward to continue to do ministry with them and with other churches in our community as uh, we see. But, but none of that is able to happen without the gifts you give, um, without the, 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 the offerings that you send in, mail in, um, leave in our offering plate, um, that you text in online. Um, we appreciate it. It allows us to do so much uh, good in the name of Jesus. Thank you. And with that, let us then uh, receive this benediction, this blessing, and then Clay will lead us into a song of praise. That we might go forth into this world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good and render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor every person. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the powers of the Holy Spirit. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen.